Burma is a country of 48 million inhabitants nestled in the heart of Southeast Asia. The overwhelming majority of Burmese are Buddhists, and Buddhist monks play an instrumental part in Burmese culture. Most men spend at least some portion of their lifetimes as monks, and these saffron-clothed men fulfill roles of charismatic leadership in Burmese society. Modern-day Burma is a result of the migration of different groups of Southeast Asian peoples. The Pew from Tibet and India, the Mons from Cambodia, Mongol Burmans from the Himalayas, and various Thai tribes. The territory was marginally unified in the mid-16th century under a long line of Tongu kings, though the Mons and other northern groups attempted to establish their own kingdoms in the 18th century. The 19th century brought with it European occupation, and the British invaded in 1824, 1852, and 1883. Great Britain controlled Burma as part of British India. I think the British attitude toward Burma can best be summed up in this movie poster for Objective Burma, starring Errol Flynn. Burma became independent in 1948. Though colonization is widely regarded as oppressive and deleterious to the native culture, instances of cultural understanding do emerge from colonial interaction. That is not to say that I support colonization. It's just that in my search to learn more about the Burmese culture, specifically in regards to what they wore, I came across many British travelogues dating back to the 19th and 20th centuries. While some were ethnocentric in their accounts of the Burmese, many provided insight into the lives of the people they came across, how they constructed their homes, what they ate, the music they created, and, what was most fascinating for me, the clothing they made and wore. As for the weaving process, Malcolm leaves a more detailed account. Their loom differs in no respect from ours, except for foot paddles, they have rings or stirrups in which the feet are placed. When figures are to be introduced, however, the mechanism is ingenious, and the labor very tedious. The colors for this purpose are each on a separate bobbin or shuttle, passed back and forth with the finger as the weaving advances. In this manner, the stripes have both warp and weft of the same color, like ribbons put together. Sometimes a more curious process is adopted, which carries the figure aside into other stripes, in a manner which no British loom could ever imitate. To comb the Other authors describe in detail the dress of Burmese men and women. Women wore a long piece of silk or cotton called a tamane, which was about a yard and a half in length. Tamanes are usually made in two pieces with two different patterns. In Gwendolyn Galton and Trench Gascoigne's account entitled Among Pagodas and Fair Ladies, an account of a tour through Burma, Galton describes the wearing of a tamane as such. The tamane is worn like a very tight skirt, and is fastened round the chest, the two ends being attached together by a wonderfully cunning twist which covers the woman and unless managed with great dexterity and worn by a person who is fully versed in the swaying movement necessary to keep it in its place might possibly leave a trifle less than was desirable to the imagination. Not surprisingly, 
I came across many of these references to the slit created when the Burmese women walked in their tamines. Words like coquettish, delicate, exotic, and picturesque pepper most colonial descriptions. Words like these highlight the convoluted nature of extracting cultural information through the eyes of colonizers. As for men, they are described as wearing a jacket called an injean made of muslin, and a silk petticoat shorter than that of the woman called a paso. Both men and women wore sandals made of cowhide covered with cloth and two straps that went across the big toe and instep, looking much like our modern flip-flops.